all those who may be joining us online. We welcome you to Wednesday in the Word. We thank God for what he's doing. These are incredible times. And I was saying to those who are in the house, thank them for coming out because we got a holiday tomorrow. And like everybody, I know many of us are working on getting things done. So just to come out and be in God's presence is a wonderful thing. And I'm praying for all of us because sometimes holidays are interesting because you have to be with family who you may not necessarily be always fond of. And it's a great opportunity to practice patience and the goodness of God and to remember, just love them. Just love them. You know, it's three hours, four hours. You can make it. You can make it. Just in your mind, imagine this is just two movies. I got to make it through two movies. Just two movies. If I can make it through this, I'm all right. It's a plane ride. It's a bus ride. You just make it through. But God is with us. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk for a moment. Because the Lord gave us a prophetic word that I'm going to touch on, then I'm going to go into the teaching. Some of you know, some of you don't, that it was... Patrick, it was literally 86 days ago. 86 days ago. Today is the 86th day. 86 days ago, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and told me to go on um, live in the morning. We call them morning glory. And he said to pray. And I began to pray and the prophetic word came. And the Lord said, tell the people to begin to prepare themselves for there's a shaking coming. A couple of you remember that. There's a shaking command. The word was, and on the 40th day, the whole world will look up and say, what is going on? But then by the 90th day, everything would change again. Okay. On the 40th day is when Israel got attacked. None of us knew that. That was 40 days before it happened. On the 40th day from that prophetic word is when Israel was attacked. We're now at day 86 and they're talking about the ceasefire coming. Now, I'm only saying this because as I was looking at the dates, I was talking with Angela or looking at the numbers. I had her do the numbers and send them to me. And I'm going, God, only you know these things. That 86 days ago, in the middle of the night, the Lord would wake us up and say, pray. And as I began to pray in the spirit, the Lord said, tell my people, 40 days from now, the world will say something has changed. Then by the 90th day, everything would change again. I'm saying that because the Lord wants us to hear him and not be shocked. Most of the time, the reason we're so overwhelmed with fear is because we didn't hear the Lord speak first. But when you look at Scripture, God would always tell the prophets and tell the patriarchs and the matriarchs things that were coming before they showed up. I believe many times the reason that fear has been so strong in the earth now is because we have disconnected from the true voice of God. And we're sitting around listening to what I call just entertainment voices. Not abiding in the spirit, not abiding in the presence of God. Because if we're sitting in the presence of God, if you look at the prophets in scripture, the thing they prophesied most was the times and seasons. What was coming in the earth, how to prepare, how to walk in it. They weren't just trying to prophesy to someone back then, you know, here now everybody wants to prophesy a car in the house. Back then they would have had to prophesy a hut and a chariot. Nobody was prophesying huts and chariots in the Bible. What they were prophesying was times and seasons. Why? Because if you can cooperate with God's time and season, you can walk out your destiny in the earth without fear. Because in your spirit, you already know God told you, these days are coming, prepare. So a bad day isn't really a bad day if you're prepared. And God tells you, good days are coming, rejoice and tell the people to prepare and get ready. The job of the prophetic, the job of the voice of the Lord, the job of those that hear God and intercessors is to keep us moving in God's timeline so we don't get stuck, so that your sorrow doesn't become so loud you miss the next thing God is doing, so that you don't get so busy rejoicing in the current breakthrough that you don't put up supplies for the winter that you don't see is coming. So the prophetic keeps us moving. The voice of the Lord keeps us going forward. And if we hear him, we can always take territory. In the kingdom of God, everything that God does is about taking territory. It's advancing. Advancing. What does that mean? As you walk with God, your life is supposed to keep increasing. You don't just have some joy. Your joy gets bigger until it becomes joy unspeakable and full of glory. You don't just have some peace, but you have the peace of the Lord, 
which passes all understanding. You don't just have some victory, but you have the victory of the cross, which means everything is underneath your feet. So, what God gives us is this ever-expanding level of dominion. Now, in the world, we're always struggling for what we have. It's a continual battle. You're, you're always fighting. You got a house, you got to keep fighting to pay the bills of the house. You got a family, you, you, everybody keeps struggling to just keep things together. But when God enters into it, it becomes a supernatural endeavor where God says, you're not just fighting to keep your family, I'll keep the borders of your house. You're not just paying off your house, I'm entering into it because you're in a supernatural financial stream now where your tithe, you pay more with the 90 than you could with the 100 because God will make the 90 stretch where the 100 kept falling apart. When you enter in with God, God says it's not just what your own skill can tell you, but I'll whisper to you the thoughts and intents of people's hearts so that they can't get past you, they can't fool you, they can't trick you so that you're not doing business with a thief. So the Holy Spirit enters into a divine partnership with you. But God can only walk with you where you allow him. So in the kingdom, it's about partnering with him. That's part of what we've been doing as we're looking at these passages the last couple of weeks on these tribes that were so prophetic how they walked ahead of the rest of Israel. Now, I've been teaching on the tribes. I'm going to go back and teach on it and expand on it. But it's amazing that when we look at how God was walking with them, why was Issachar, I'm going to go back to that, that tribe of Issachar. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Why was the tribe of Issachar so important? This explains why intercessors, worshipers, and prophets if you're, if you're taking notes, if you're holding on to it, those three things, intercessors, worshipers, and prophets, all three of those are really the tribe of Issachar. Intercessors, those that through prayer agree with the mind of God so that they can speak God's will into the earth and change it. Intercession is not just praying. Many times when there are prayer meetings, and prayer meetings seem just like a lot of people talking, I love intercession. I can't stand church prayer. I love intercession. I love to intercede. I love to stand in between earth and heaven and hear what God is saying and then say what God is saying until God's will invades the earth's will and makes it obey his will. I love intercession because intercession always leaves the room full of victory. That's why you know you've broken through. Whenever you're teaching on prayer or intercession, the sound of breakthrough is when joy comes in the room. When you're always laboring and you're praying and everybody sounds miserable, that's not breakthrough. When everybody is always just weeping and crying and it doesn't feel any better and why is it like this, that's not breakthrough. That's just a lot of loud talking. Intercession is to connect to the will of God and agree with his will until his will comes into that room and then into the earth. So if you don't know his will, you can't pray his will. Now, this is where we started getting the idea of if it be thy will prayers, because we would pray the Lord's prayer. But we have to remember the Lord's Prayer is not the prayer that Jesus prayed all the time. It was a model for us. So when Jesus gives to the disciples the Lord's Prayer, he wasn't saying to pray all the time, if it be thy will. What he told them to declare, thy will be done. There was no if in that prayer. Thy will be done. It was a proclamation that we who are of the covenant choose to command the covenant to manifest. We're commanding the covenant to manifest because we have the rights of children of God. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There was no if in their prayer. Now, many of us, when we go to pray, we approach, we approach God with the if. So our prayers have been infected with doubt because if is a conditional word. I'll be there tomorrow if something doesn't happen. I'm signing this contract, and I'll make this amount of money if we produce this 
in time. I'm going to buy that car if the credit goes through. If is a conditional word. There is no if in the promise of God. There are ifs that show up when you're obeying principles. So that's about when God says, I'm going to do something for you personally, and he tells you what the requirement is. But for the scriptures that are based on what he did himself, there's no if. All he asks you to do is believe. He says, I'll heal you if you believe. I'll deliver you if you believe. The only if in Scripture is, is there faith? Faith. His will is never in doubt. I'm going to say that again. His will is never in doubt. Depending on how big the problem, when we go to pray, we throw an if into it because it's so big, if it doesn't happen, we want to make sure we had a get out of jail free card. That if is to make us not look like our prayer didn't work. That if is to cover ourselves. That if is about our pride. That if is to make us look okay. But you don't need the if when you realize it is God's responsibility to bring it to pass, not yours. So when God does it, glory to God. If God doesn't do it, that's on God. All he asked me to do was believe. You've got to take the struggle out of the prayer life by reminding yourself it is both God's power and God's word. It's not my power. It's not my word. It's God's power and God's word. So you lay it at the feet of God. Now, the key is once you pray, you've got to begin to go into thanksgiving. And it's funny, we're talking about that right now since tomorrow is Thanksgiving. The key to prayer being answered is Thanksgiving. The key to unlocking your prayer life is end your prayer with Thanksgiving. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Enter into his gates with Thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with Praise. Okay, so the Bible says when you're going to come before God, the key that unlocks the first door into his presence is thanksgiving. Now, this is essential. If you run into God's presence and you start asking for stuff and there has been no thanksgiving to precede you, your prayer is illegal. Ah. Ooh! That's a shaka maka Zulu moment right there. That's a, that's a whole lot of hollering moment. Because we don't understand that God says, I'm not holding anybody hostage. I'm not, I'm not beating anybody up. I'm not, you know, inspecting all your mistakes. He says, but I want you to understand when you come before me, you've got to let Thanksgiving go out of your mouth first. Why? Thanksgiving resets your thinking. It's not just for God, it's for you. Because the week has been oppressive. You've had bad news from family. You've had stuff go crazy on the job. You've had people argue with you. So you've got all that in your mind. So what God is saying is, the first 20 minutes of your prayer time, I'm going to save you 20 minutes of frustration. If you would give God five minutes of thanksgiving, your brain would let all that stuff go. Because if you truly start to thank God for his goodness, your brain is going to say, all right, just forgive them and move on. If you don't enter in with thanksgiving, the first thing you want to pray about is what they said and what they did and who made a mistake and who didn't honor you and who didn't show up. And so you're spending your time complaining instead of praying. And God says, I can't do anything with that complaining. Complaining isn't based on my word. Complaining is based on your emotion. I cannot manifest your emotion as though it's supernatural. I need you to agree with me. So the only way you can agree with me is you have to believe I am helping you. Start thanking me. 
I don't know where the help is coming from. I don't know when the help is coming. I don't know how you're going to do it. But God, let me thank you right now that you're in charge. You're working it out for me. And that little bit of thanksgiving, God begins to encircle you, and he begins to cause the answer to come. But you have to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Just giving thanks. Giving thanks. It's so simple. But when's the last time you just told somebody in your family? When's the last time you called some of your friends and didn't ask for anything, but just kept them on the phone and said, I want to tell you how thankful I am for you. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. I want to tell you that this, this, and this you've done in my life has blessed me. When is the last time you just had a moment to be thankful for them? When's the last time you called your family members who are just getting on your nerves, doing everything wrong, causing stuff to be chaotic? When's the last time you looked past their chaos and called them up anyway and said, I need you to know, I love the way you do this. I love how you treat people. I love, even if they're treating you wrong, find somebody they treat right and bring that up. <laughs> I had a friend of mine who God has delivered him now, but he used to be a thief. He was a thief. He was a thief. We knew he was a thief. And the Lord told me to keep loving on my friend because God was going to deliver him. And so I remember, you ever had friends that you invite them over, but you hide all the expensive stuff before they come? I mean, come on. We all got some of them friends where we love them. We want God to touch them, but you know you can't leave them in the room with your wallet. You can't do it. Anything not attached to the wall is going into a drawer before they come over. Okay. I remember one time, they, they, and they know this, they were coming over to my house for a meal, and I remember everything in my house, everything that could be sold. Because the last time they'd come over, stuff went missing. And the Lord told me not to throw them away. So I invited them back over. They came over for a meal. I put all my stuff, I was, I was living in another city. I put all my good stuff in, in a, in, underneath the drawer. And then, then I said, that ain't going to work. And I locked it in a bag, put it in the back of the closet. I said, that ain't going to work because if they come in here to go to the bathroom, they might get in that bag. So I drove all my good stuff to another friend's house and said, I'm going to leave this over here. And they said, oh, he coming over for dinner. I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody knew he was a thief. Now, here's the thing. After all of that season, and the Lord said, but there's gold in him. He's doing that because of how he was broken in life and how he had to live on the street for so long, and we knew that. So, I'm not throwing him away. Life broke him. Keep blessing him. Keep helping him. And so, what was so funny, I remember I said to him one day, we were sitting and eating, and I said, I need to tell you something. It was like six of us there. I said, I celebrate the skill you have at getting everything that's in your heart. He says, wow, that's deep. I said, yeah. He said, the Lord say that to you? I said, no, that's just another way of saying you're a good thief. You're a real good thief. I said, I'm going to celebrate your thievery. You, you just skilled. I said, you got discernment that's working from the Holy. You can look through a wall and see money in a pocket. I said, man, that's an anointing. Why? Because everything that the enemy tries to do in somebody's life is a gift that's been perverted. That's why we don't throw people away. That's why you have to understand that when you look at Scripture and you understand what the enemy's trying to do, you've got to approach things with thanksgiving and not bitterness. Because most folks that... We're addicted to stuff. The reason you don't throw away addicts is because anybody who's been an addict, and I, I was at one time, if you come out of addiction, that you're a worshiper. Most people who struggle with addiction and get delivered, they're really worshipers. But the enemy perverted that thing and tried to steal the gift because worship is being addicted to the very face of God. You won't leave him alone. David was an addict. He was addicted to the presence of God. But in the world, when we see something be twisted in the wrong direction, we throw them away rather than, let me thank God for that gift that's in there that's just been turned in the wrong direction. Mm. 
Most people that struggle with anger are really called to be pastors because they're, they're anointed to defend the sheep. And when they see stuff out of order, they flare up. You look at Peter. You look at Paul. The people who had the biggest anger issues when the Holy Ghost got a hold of them became the defenders of the church. But if we don't see past where you are through thanksgiving, we can't walk with you until your gift wakes up. A lot of people who struggled with hearing voices and strange stuff happening to them, they really were watchmen. They were called to abide in the presence of God because there's a prophetic anointing on them. And because the enemy recognized there was a prophetic anointing, he started sending the wrong voices early to terrorize them and get them to play around with Ouija boards or horoscopes or reading tea leaves or going to psychics because there was a prophetic mantle on you from the time you were born. The enemy recognized it, and there was nobody from the kingdom walking around you to wake it up and teach you. So the enemy said, if the church won't open up the gift inside of them, I'll pull them in the wrong direction. So we're so busy saying the devil did it, we don't recognize the devil doesn't create. He can only pervert what God created. So if we would recognize there's something from God in that life, let's not throw them away. Let's see what was God making them to be and now help restore that, redeem that. That's what Thanksgiving does. Thanksgiving keeps you in the right mindset so that you don't throw people away, so you don't throw purpose away, so you don't throw yourself away. You keep thanking God. Lord, I don't like what I see, but oh, it's better than what it was. I don't like where I am, but I'm still alive. You have to find a way to thank him. Don't ever get to the place where you feel like your world is in such a bad condition that there's no hope. That's what Thanksgiving will do. Thanksgiving brings hope. Be thankful. Find a way to praise him. Find a way to thank him. Find a way. Now, that's why that's so important because if you are intercessor, worshiper, or prophet, if you don't abide in a place of Thanksgiving, your gift turns bitter. Your gift turns bitter. Let me explain that. Okay. Again, I'm not going to talk too long. Is this, is this all right for tonight? Is this helping anybody? Okay. So many of you, because you are seers, and the Bible says before they were called prophets in those days, they were called seers. Why were they called seers? Because the primary thing that awakens first in a prophetic life, in someone who's being led by God, is you begin to have dreams, pictures, or you feel something. You're discerning by how you feel. You walk into a room and you have peace or you walk into a room and you don't feel at peace and that's you feeling or seeing the atmosphere. That's normal. That's scriptural. But because we're not taught it, what happens is we tell many prophetic folks that you're just being critical. You're judging folks. Why are you always looking at people like they're crazy? And yet, whenever your discernment turns out to be true, nobody comes back and says you were right. Because we love to accuse those with discernment of being judgmental because we didn't see what you saw. But when God has awakened your spirit to see, you can't not see. It's part of your gifting. It's part of what God has given you. You can't just turn it off. And what happens to many folks as we're walking with God, as we're growing in the kingdom, again, this is about the Issachar, the tribe of Issachar. I'm hitting them, then I'm going to hit another one. The tribe of Issachar, because they understood times and seasons, because they understood prophetically, it was speaking of a prophetic culture, a prophetic mindset. Because they could partner with God by discerning what time it is, and what God is doing, they could tell all of Israel how to agree with God. What we've done many times in prophetic culture or in the kingdom of God is because we've turned the prophetic into entertainment rather than preparation, then when God is trying to prepare us for something, we don't get prepared because anything that doesn't entertain my spirit 
I don't want it. So if you come to me and say, I hear the Lord saying, you know, there's a famine coming, but we need to sow extra, Joseph, for the next seven years because what we reap in these next seven years is going to feed us for another seven. Gotcha. That was a prophetic word. But if I don't want to be prepared but only entertained, I take a word like that and I say, no, that's a negative word. I don't want a negative word because I don't understand God doesn't give negative words. He gives words of preparation. It's only negative if you didn't hear the strategy. So much of what we've learned to call negative words or words that didn't sound good to us, it's because we didn't ask God, how do I prepare for this? The word was not against you. It was calling you into preparation. We went to a prayer meeting. This is years ago. And then I got to read the scripture. I can't just do the whole night teaching. I, I, I got to read at least one scripture. <laughs> Even though I've quoted a few already. I'll never forget I was um, about to do a trip going out of the country, and we had a prayer team of 12 people, 12 intercessors. And they called us together, and we got together to pray, and they began to pray. They were just really going after the presence of God. You know, when all the tongues are real loud and strong, and yeah, oh, and they was through the roof. They was just going. And I'm in the chair like this, just rocking, going, ooh, this is, this is powerful. This is tight. God is in this place. And then they started talking. They looked at me and said, you can't go on that mission trip. I said, what? You can't go. For the Lord has shown us that you're going to die if you go. I said, who's going to die? You're going to die. Twelve intercessors. I'm sitting in this chair. They're surrounding me praying. You're going to die. I said, I'm going to die. And the head intercessor, she began to weep. She said, I saw it in a vision. You were laid out in a casket. You were dead, man of God. You were dead. I said, oh, no. Now the rest of them started speaking. I believe that's true, man of God. It's going to happen. You're going to die if you go. You're going to die. Now, this was my first big mission trip. That mission trip I talk about going to Nepal. This is before that trip. This was our last weekend prayer time. I'm being surrounded by intercessors who really had proven to me they knew how to pray. One worked for TVN, another one worked for another major ministry. These were the guys who, if you need prayer, you call these guys, and I'm sitting in their house, and they telling me I'm going to die. Little black ball boy going to die. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be dead soon. I'm going to die. So they said so much that I was going to die, I started to believe I was going to die. And I'm sitting in the chair going, oh, no, I should cancel this trip. Because they said they heard the Lord. I'm in the car. I'm talking to my cousin who was driving. She said, yeah, you might want to cancel that trip. I'm like, even you? She said, yeah, I kind of feel bad about it too. I don't think you're supposed to go. I called my father. My father said, are you? <laughs> my father's hilarious. He says, are you crying? Are you crying? He said, what's wrong with you? I said, they said, I'm going to die. He said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I can't say the next word he called me. But imagine. <laughs> yes. It is a word directly for my own culture. Okay. So he says that word, and then he says, get a hold of yourself. <laughs> I'll never tell this whole story truthfully. This is what the truth was. He said, get a hold of yourself. I said, yes, sir. He says, didn't we already pray? Yes. Didn't the Lord tell us you were supposed to go? Yes. Then what are we talking about? And this is when deliverance hit me. He said, they've discerned the trouble, but they didn't pray for an answer. They got stuck with the trouble. 
He said, yes, you're going to another place. God's already told you he's going to get a lot of people saved. You're going to encounter some resistance and warfare, and you're going to have the enemy probably try to kill you. This should not be a shock to you. He said, so either stay in America and live afraid or go and obey God. And his last words, he said, because if you go and die obeying God, at least you die doing his will. He said, because we do not run. I said, yes, sir. Hung the phone up. The next day, called them all back. I said, I appreciate your prayers. Stop praying for me. <laughs> I did. I called them all. I said, stop praying for me. I said, you're stuck in the negative. There's an answer on the side of what you're feeling, but you don't know how to get past your emotions. So that's why I started there. So too many times in intercession, the reason we're not breaking through is you felt something in your soul and didn't know how to get past your soul. And you got stuck with the negative feeling, the fear, the trauma, the drama, whatever somebody told you, and that thing got stuck right there. You didn't move past it. Well, I know what I'm feeling. Yes, what you're feeling is valid, but what you're feeling is not all there is. You've got to pray past your feelings. You've got to pray until you hear God speaks. Your feeling is not the end of it. You discern something. That's why your feelings woke up. But once you discerned it, what is God saying past your emotions? Because most of us get stuck there. And if you stop praying in the emotional place, you will leave prayer burdened. That's how they used to always teach prayer. I've got a burden from the Lord. I have to carry this. I can't let this go. I'm just so sorrowful about it. I feel heavy in my heart. No, prayer is not heavy. Prayer should not be a burden. Prayer shouldn't feel like a weight. It shouldn't have you over in a corner just crying all day and night going, I don't know who this is about, but it's just terrible. No, that's your soul. That's your soul. The Lord needed me to carry this. God lets you carry with him spiritual battles, not emotional battles. I'm going to say that again. In the spirit, you walk with God. You don't get stuck in an emotional battle. You carry it by the spirit. So you have to speak the word of God, stand with God, and then pray the word and release it back to him. You can get stuck in the emotion. If we are immature, all of us in our prayer lives, sometimes the emotion is louder than the spirit. Your mind, your mind, what you're going through mentally will be loud. It's hard to get past it, but you can't get stuck there. Yes, the money's run out. Yes, it looks bad. Yes, you've got to talk to the bank. Yes, you've got to pay these bills. Yes, if you're growing and building we were recently in a season where it was time to grow, and I needed to have some money come in so I could pay off some of the old stuff that had already been done because it was t it's time to advance. We're in advancing season now. And nobody knew any of that, and I'm walking through it, and there was a little over $10,000 that needed to be sorted out within a 24-hour period. And there was some money that had come in, but there was, and the Lord said, don't you touch anything else. I'm going to handle this for you. I said, but Lord, it's got to be done. This is the second notification. I could handle this, but it's going to empty everything. The Lord said to me, do you believe me or not? I said, I do. He said, then start thanking me. Thank me every time it comes to your mind. Thank me and praise me. Thank me and say I'm worthy. He said, because if you're only building according to the money you have in your pocket, you will only live at the level of your own bank account. He said, so I'm tired of you telling me what you need. Thank me. I already have it. So I began to thank him. I began to thank him. I began to thank him. I'm teaching you how I live. I teach what scripture says works. I don't do theory. This works. And as I was thanking God over and over throughout the day, in early in the morning, like I wake up 3, 30, 4 o'clock almost every morning, early in the morning I wake up. The Lord said, check your accounts. I said, what? Check your accounts. Someone who I'd helped in their company a long time ago had a breakthrough I didn't know about and sent money. And I'm looking going, oh, they didn't even say they were sending this. I said, Lord, he said, I knew it was coming. I'm the one who told them to send it to you. 
Why do you think I had you connect with them years ago to help them get a breakthrough? I said, are you kidding? The Lord said, in my calendar, everything showing up is right on time. On your calendar, you were sweating about it. I wasn't. I just needed you to agree with me. Agree with me. You see, we handle problems like they're problems because we don't think he's in those problems with us. But if he's partnering with you, stop sweating the small stuff. Face it with faith. Intercessors get stuck because we start to think we have to convince God to come through. You don't have to manipulate God to get an answer. Everything in the Bible is yes and amen. So when I told all of them, stop praying for me, your prayers are locked in emotion. I remember they sent the last word before I was heading to go to the plane. We're leaving Orange County, going to LAX, and one of the sisters came by as we're getting on the van, all of us getting on the van, and she just stretched her hand like she was praying, stretched her hand with tears flowing. Bye, Brother Michael. Well, now I think I'm going to die again. (laughs) Why? Because some people are not going to stop being negative, so you have to stop listening to them. See, when God gives you a revelation, when God speaks to you, it's for you. You can't get stuck saying, but they still think they are holding your prayer life hostage. God will move at the level of your faith. You cannot live your whole life consumed or controlled by other people's reactions. He'll do it for you if you believe. Your faith is enough. Your faith is enough. The faith of your house is enough. The faith in your family is enough. You don't have to have 30 people believing with you. We teach that the bigger the problem, the more intercessors you need. That's not in Scripture. Stop getting all these people involved in your life who don't have faith for your life. I have a handful of people that pray about everything that God has given me to do because I know they have faith. Outside of them, I don't talk to anybody else. People see my life unfold, but they don't hear it beforehand. Why? Because they don't have faith for that level. You got to make sure the people praying for you have faith for the level you're going to. Not where you are now, where you're going to. You got a $10 million dream and you got $100,000 friends. You got to find some other folks to help you pray. Find people who can pray at the level of where you're going. You're walking in freedom. And every time they see you, they're looking at you like you're still bound. You need some new friends. Because where you're going is not controlled by where you were. So the first one is intercession, walk by faith, live in thanksgiving, approach God not based on emotion, but based on the word. Okay. The second, worshipers. This is the tribe of Issachar, worshipers. Why? Intercessors have to see what God is doing and then pray from the future. You're praying from the future. You're praying from the yes of God. It's not a wrestling match. You're not trying to get God to do it. It's already done. So you have to pray from the future. I'm already healed. I'm already blessed. It's already done. And I'm agreeing with God. That's why I can thank him because it's already handled. Worshippers, worshipers are declaring based on God's identity. So intercessors are praying from the work that's been done. Intercession is based on the work of God, the power of God. God has already accomplished this. I'm praying for healing. The work of healing was done at the cross. I'm praying for this person to be delivered. Deliverance was given at the cross. You're praying from a work that's already done. Worship is based on who he is. So when you enter into worship, you have to see who God is in order to bring that into the room. I'm going to use a really strange phrase, but it's a good phrase. You have to bring the isness of God into the room. The isness. You know, black folk make up their own words. It's just, come on, I've got my own dictionary at home. 
The isness of God, who God is, changes what you're going through. Who God is changes what you're going through. It's who he is. It's the I am of God, the I am nature, the I am revelation, the truth of who he is. Who God is changes what's around me. So I have to worship God based on his isness, his identity, the truth of God, the nature of God the personality and the personhood of God. I have to know who he is because worship is not based on what God has done or can do. Worship lives from the throne room. In his presence is fullness of joy. So I'm worshiping publicly based on who he is eternally. He's always good. He's always righteous. He's always faithful. He's always pure. He's always powerful. He is always my father. He is always on my side. He is always omniscient, omnipresent. He is always present and powerful. He is always right there to deliver. He is always moving mountains, the way maker. He is these things always. So when I enter into worship, I am not trying to get God to do something. I am worshiping God because if I connect with who he is, who he is enters the room around me. And if I bring who he is into the room, who he is begins to manifest through me because you are the bridge for the almighty. So who he is flows through you when you recognize who he is. That's why if you need wisdom, the Bible says approach God. But I have discovered through the years in a situation where you need an answer, if you've got a business deal, a family problem, something going wrong, and you suddenly need wisdom and you don't know the answer, all you need to do is start worshiping him as the all-knowing God. Call, you're the God of all wisdom. You've got all the wisdom in your hand. You know all things. You created the earth, the universe. You put the stars in place. You are the master craftsman. You created cells at their smallest structure, put atoms in place, made neutrons and protons and electrons spin around together and cause all life to be. You made the first cell of creation while you made galaxies to spin from your hand. If you can do all that, tell me, do I go left or do I go right? And he will speak just as quick as you ask because worshiping who he is will cause him to release it to you. But we treat it like it's a battle. So instead of worshiping God, we start complaining. Lord, I don't know what to do. We need your wisdom. I'm stuck. I don't know which way to go. God says, but your complaining won't get an answer. Tell me who I am. Lord, I, I'm, I'm doing business with someone I can't trust or, or over here I've got to work with a lawyer or I feel like people are lying to me or I don't know what my family is saying if it's true, so I'm stuck. Mm. You are the spirit of truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the truth in every situation. So, Lord, right now I honor you because your truth is perfect. You said where you are, you would set me free. God, I need your truth to show up and let me know, is this true or a lie? My emotions can't be trusted. But, Lord, you said if I called on you, all of a sudden in here you'll know, mm, that's the truth. Nope, that's a lie. I've had the Lord save me from eight deals, business deals that I was going to do with family and friends that would have cost me a lot of money. But right before I would go into the deal or sign the contract, I would sit and worship a couple of times in the car, the other times in my house. And I said, you are the God of truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. If you are truth, don't let me walk in a lie. Talk to me. Which way do I go? And every single time, he said to me, on six times, it's a lie. This is not going to work. The other two times, he said it will, and it worked those two. And the other six, everybody else lost a lot of money. Why? Because God, if you will worship who he is, who he is will get in the room around you. If you've got kids and you're struggling with how do I father, how do I mother, or you're the aunt or the, the uncle and you're helping, 
Don't sit there and treat every kid like you know how to figure them out. They came from God. So go back to the God who sent them. And say, God, you're a good father. You're a father. You're my father. You're a good shepherd. You lead me. I'm asking you, with this child and this child, they're different. How do I talk to this one and what do I do with this one? And he'll talk to you. But he won't talk to you if you don't ask. You have to first bring him in the room. Recognize who he is through worship. And then that part of him will fall on you. He's a great God. But this is why the tribe of Issachar is so important because if you don't learn how to go into that place, we all have to learn it. If we don't learn how to go into the place of worship that's not infected by our own world issues. Most of our worship gets infected by our world issues. However, the week was, whatever happened on your job, whatever's going on in your family, so your worship gets infected by all that drama, because I can't lift my hands right away. It took me 30 minutes to get my hands from here to here to here to here <laughs> because nobody in here knows what I'm going through. And so I'm going to hold back my worship to God based on the stuff that went on in my world. So I'm punishing God because of people. Woo! I'm robbing God because I got drama in my life. <laughs> not recognizing that whatever you release to him, he's dropping heaven back on you. And that instantaneous exchange of supernatural life is what you need so you can be transformed so that what was bothering you gets broken in an instant. But because we're not taught this, too many times all of us come before God this is about the tribe of Issachar. The tribe of Issachar has to tell the rest of the nation what time it is. So the enemy has always known the one thing he does to try to stop us all from breaking forward, if he can mess up the flow of worship, the whole congregation is messed up. If he can stop you from worshiping in your house, then your house gets stuck. If you're not worshiping over your business, over your finances, then your finances start to get, your finances move at the speed of your own mentality instead of heaven's flow. So the battle is for the worship. So as worshipers, you have to always keep that flow going no matter what's going on around you. Don't let life steal your flow. Don't let life steal your flow. You have to keep your flow going. You have to hold on to it. You have to keep that worship bubbling up out of you because that is the river where the answers come through. That's the presence, the supernatural presence. The Lord told me a long time ago, he said, as I have called you to walk before me and to release times and seasons, you can't let your worship get messed up. And I said, what do you mean? He said, don't let your worship get messed up. And I understood later on what the Lord was talking about because we went into a service where the Lord was moving in a powerful way. And I noticed in the service, the presence of God was flowing, but nobody was getting healed or delivered. It was a good service, but nothing happened. Nothing. I mean, you ever been in a service where it was a really nice service, but nothing really happened? You know, no healing, no deliverance, no miracles. Nobody got saved. It was just, ah, 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 you know. Tamarine, shoes, feet, clap, woo, ah, we all go home. Okay, great. And that's nice, but that's not supernatural. Jesus is the revelation of when heaven invades earth, something changes. Something changes. If nothing in the room changes except the level of the singing, mm-mm. God was there, but we didn't let him. You have to let God arise. You have to let him take over. And so what I discovered years ago was, I'll never forget this, watching my family worship, my aunt, wonderful woman of God, wonderful woman of God. I grew up with people who could just begin to get lost in the presence of God. 
and they taught me that old phrase, get lost in him. I, I know, you know, you do the same thing. How do you know you're lost in God? You get lost in God when time loses value when time loses value. If you're worshiping God and you know you've been singing for 30 seconds, it's been 1.48 minutes, we've been singing this song for three minutes, will we please sing another song? Nobody went anywhere. <laughs> if you're all looking at each other around the room going, are we please going to sing another song? Nothing happened. But worship is when you crack the veil between earth and heaven. You step out of time into the eternal. The eternal has no clock. When you step into the eternal flow, that's when you get lost. You get lost when suddenly you got a room full of people and it's an hour later and everybody's singing the same song. And everybody's going, this is good, let's sing it again. In any other situation, everybody's going, can we not sing the same song? But in worship, when you've been caught in the arms of the Almighty, when he leans from heaven into the room and begins to breathe upon your face, clocks lose their authority and time begins to fade away. And in that time, that's when God begins to breathe. And everything inside of God gets loosed in the room. And suddenly, there's healings over here. And somebody's getting touched. And somebody's crying over here. And somebody's weeping on the floor. What's going on? God is receiving the worship. See, always remember, worship is not what you did. It's what he received. <laughs> we make worship to be the thing we do. That's only 50% of it. Worship wasn't worship until God received it. Oh, see, we don't even talk about that anymore. That's what Malachi discovered when God said, you keep bringing me lambs, I don't receive any of them. Go back and tell the people, all these lambs you brought me are not received. It's what God was talking about when he said to Ezekiel, all of your priests keep coming to me, but I'm not listening to them. He tells Jeremiah, you're talking to me, but I'm not hearing you. What is God saying? What God was declaring is it's not complete until heaven says yes. So that we don't get consumed by our own skill and think it's just about how we make it sound. No. Did he receive it? Did he receive it? You know the thing about a gift? No matter how expensive the gift, if the person you give it to gives it back to you, nothing happened. There was no exchange. It has to be received. If you bring a gift to them, if you bought something for your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, you, you give them a gift and they go, mm -mm, I don't like that color. How did you not know I don't like that color? We've been together all these years and you don't know I can't stand that color? Do I have anything in my closet that looks that color? Why? Because to give them something that they didn't want is a revelation that you don't know them. What we forget about worship is worship is not just a revelation of what you wanted to bring. What did he want? Did anybody ask God what he wanted today? Did anybody even ask him, do you want a fast song or a slow song? Do you want us just to weep before you? Are tears on your menu today? Do you just want us to clap our hands and shout, what's on your menu? Sir, what would please you? When we don't ask God what he wants, we are insulting him because we're telling him you're going to eat whatever I give you. Woo! But he made it clear over and over in the Old Testament. He said, all these things you brought me, take them back home. None of this has pleased me. Why? Because nobody asked me what I wanted. We were in the midst of a worship service. Everybody was worshiping. My dear little aunt, she's sitting on the second row, and everybody is just, it was just great. It was a great, it was a great night. I thought it was a great night. Everybody was worshiping. 
Tears were flowing and people just, and the whole church was, oh, the Lord is here. My aunt was sitting on the second row. She kept looking around like, like a mosquito or something was around her. You know how spiritual folks, we, you know, you start looking around like you see something, you don't see nothing. You just don't know what God is doing, so you won't look deep. And so she was looking around. All of a sudden, she said, oh. And so she just stood up. Everybody else is just being loud and going on. And she stood up. And she just began to go, your name is worthy to be praised. You alone I raise in anthems of love and mercy. Oh, Lord, I magnify you now. And the whole place is looking at her like, what are you doing? Because the organ was going, the piano was going. We had three guitars, a drum. We had, um, our church had music. And everybody's looking at her like, what are you doing? This is not what we're doing. And she just keeps, for you are worthy to be praised. This anthem, Lord, I raise. I call upon you, holy Father, and all of a sudden, a couple of the other ladies began to sing what she was singing, and the next thing you know, the whole church is weeping. And then people are starting to just bow down, and they're boom, everybody's just crying. The power of God, we're all on our faces. How did you hear the one song none of us heard? She asked. While everybody else was going on, she was sitting there going, Lord, is this what you want? And the Lord spoke to her and said, you're the only one that asked me today. Here's the song that's on my heart. And she gave him the song, and he wrecked the room. Yes, I agree. And so what happens, <laughs> and so what happens, that was like a good prophetic moment. To be able to do that, you got to be online with God. <laughs> and what stops us is we don't ask him. So this whole tribe of Issachar, it starts with, as you pray, what is his will? How do we know his will? In the word of God. As you worship, what is his will? How do you know his will? What's on the heart of God? Prayer comes from the mind of God, the word. Worship comes from the heart of God. What's the Holy Spirit saying right now? That's why the Bible says, worship him in spirit and in truth. There's a lot of us that enter into spirit, but we're not being true. What's the truth? Okay, being in the spirit means we all are in the spirit together. We're all moving with the Holy Spirit. But truth is, what is he saying inside of you? What is the truth of how you're supposed to worship? So we might all be singing one song, but is your truth that your hands should be lifted? Do you keep feeling I should fall upon my knees? Do you keep feeling I should be walking back and forth through the back of the room? If you're not being true to the expression the Holy Ghost is asking from you at that moment, if there is no freedom for you to step into that truth, then you might have been in the spirit, but you weren't in the truth. And some of us are in truth. We can feel what God wants from us, but we're not in the spirit. What does that mean? We're not going with the Holy Spirit to make it happen. So we just pull back from the rest and we go, okay, they're not going to do it. So, Lord, I'll just give it to you myself. But we won't let it out in the room. So you're in the truth, but you're not in the spirit. Because the spirit is about unity. You've got to release it out so that everybody else can catch it. In spirit and in truth. Too many times we're taught to perform instead of worship. Issachar, worshipers, intercessors, and that last part, and that prophetic mantle. My goodness. I said I was going to give you a scripture. Are, are we all right? I didn't quote 10 scriptures tonight, but I'm just... And how do you step into that whole prophetic flow? Every day, you've got to ask God what's on his heart. And then write it down. 
Now, if, if he's just saying something to you, you don't have to necessarily write it down. But I mean, but if it's a word from the Lord, whether he says, you know, I want to do this for your family, or the Lord speaks to you and just says, I love you. I'm with you. You're not alone. Many times, it doesn't have to become a prophetic word you're holding on to for the next nine years, but for at least that day, write it down. Look at it again and again throughout that day and remind yourself, today, because he didn't just say it for no reason. God knew within that 24-hour period, something was going to come to try to shake your mind. And you needed that morning before you left your house to hear the Father say, I love you. And sometimes the reason we get shaken is because we don't treat what he said with value. God's voice gets louder where he is honored. Honor the voice of the Lord in your own life. We have, God has given to the body of Christ prophets and apostles, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. And we learn to honor those, and we will always honor those. But there is no greater thing in your own life than having God talk to you yourself. Build that continually in your own walk. And being strong in hearing the voice of God doesn't mean that you ever need, that's why Paul said, despise not prophesying, because we, we don't know how to be balanced. We either don't want any prophetic unless it comes from a prophet, or we don't want any prophets because now we've gotten to the place where I can hear God for myself. It's balance. The prophetic was never supposed to be spectacular. The prophetic was supposed to be God sending confirming words and affirming words into your life through men and women he had placed in the body of Christ to strengthen you, not to manipulate you, not to own you, not to control you, to strengthen you so that in your daily walk with God, you were hearing words from God so that you could succeed in your everyday life. The prophets, the prophetic voices are supposed to come so cyclically or in every cycle or every season, they're supposed to come and either affirm, confirm, or help adjust what you're doing and where you're going so you can have success for that next season. It's not supposed to be for everyday life. That's your own walk with God. God sends his servants to help move you forward for the next season. God gave you his voice so you can live victoriously every day. And every person in this room, the Lord is with you. You have the word of God and you have the voice of the Lord. Walk with him. Be strong. Victory belongs to you. You're an overcomer. There's greatness in you. God did not bring you this far to ever let you fall. He's not going to leave you. He's got you. And learn like I did over the years that just because people are saying something doesn't necessarily mean they heard everything. So go check with God. Have at least one or two people in your life that you know hear the Lord. So when you get all these other prophetic voices, go back and check with some folks who are solid and say, this sounds great, but what's God saying in your spirit? One of the greatest prophetic words I ever got I was ready to change my whole life. Stood me up in a the crowd. They knew who I was. I knew who they were. The Lord says to you, prophet of the Lord, that you must move from the city where you are. I wouldn't be here right now because the city where I was was here. <laughs> move from the city where you are. And they were actually prophesying me into their city. They wanted me to come work with their ministry. You're to leave where you are. You're to come for, for their teams that are going to work with you. And, and, and the prophetic word sounded fantastic. And I remember I left the meeting, and we all went out for a meal. And during the meal, I'm eating, and I'm going, this must be the law. Great. And right in here, over and over, the Lord's going, you know that's not me. You know that's not me. You know that's not me. It sounds good because it will give you everything you've been praying for. Always remember the end of a struggle is not necessarily permission to move. And a struggle 
is not necessarily a sign that you're not in the right place. Sometimes the struggle is necessary. Why? Because God is raising you up to be stronger, deeper, clearer. He's also getting out of you the fear of man. And so I remember we finished the meal, and they asked me what I thought about the Word. And I was like, I really, I really feel like that's the Lord. I'm still in here. You know, that's the Lord. Because it was everything I needed, everything, 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 every, every. Every now and then, I still just look at pictures, and I'm like, that would have been where I was living. That would have been. <laughs> that would have been. <laughs> Woo! And a dear friend of mine, she's a prophet. I called her, and I said, this is the word I just got. <laughs> and she's a lot like me. She's just brutal in the Holy Ghost. She said, oh, they lying to you. I said, no, no, no. They gave a good word. She said, it's a lie. That's not what the Lord said. She said, and this was such good teaching, she said, your soul wants out of the battle so much. Your soul pulled on the gift of the prophet, and he prophesied in your direction. That's why the Bible says you have to test every word to see if it be of God. Your soul cries out, Lord, get me out of this. That's what David said. How long must I be in this battle? Oh, Lord, lift this from me. Turn this around. And your soul wants an answer. So when something comes that sounds like that's the end of your storm, you'll run toward it. That's why we don't test a lot of prophetic words. That's why most people don't ask the Holy Spirit, was that really from you? Because if it's the word that gives you permission to get out of your storm, oftentimes we run toward it and go, God just spoke to me. Did he? Because maybe the Lord wants you to finish that storm and not run from it. And so she said to me, that was not God. God was not telling you that. That's a lie. It might be tough, but you're supposed to stay. I said, but everything I've been praying for, and she, she's older. She said, don't nobody care what you've been asking God for? <laughs> Obey God. I said, you talking a little bit loud. You, you getting a little... <laughs> And she told me, don't make me drive there. She said, you know, I'll hit you. I said, yes, ma'am. Always remember God wants the best for you. Not always the easiest, but the best. God will give you the best. Stop running for easy. Go for the best. Amen? Okay. I know Thanksgiving is tomorrow. I, want, I pray all of y'all have a marvelous, glorious Thanksgiving. I pray you have a good time with family, but also, um, Kim, would you help me? Would you bring that down? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. I'm going to do it on camera and then off camera. Yeah. M Matt, please. Yes. Help your wife. Yes. <laughs> so, I told y'all last week that if y'all came, I was going to cook. And I lied to you. <laughs> so, here's what we're doing. And I'm doing this because somebody had texted me earlier and said, well, I'm not going to be in the building. Well, then you don't get none of this. <laughs> but for some reason, the Lord just put on my heart today. So this is what, and I'm looking around the room. Okay, yeah, 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 okay, this is good. So I don't know if you've ever had them. I don't know. But for some reason, and yes, I'm doing free advertisement for this company right now because I am a fan. If you've ever had nothing but cakes. Okay. So today I was up, I was getting things done, and the Lord said, just for, for all of y'all who are here, so when I'm about to pray for y'all and release y'all, I just wanted some of y'all who are sitting at home who should have been here, you don't get no cake tonight. That's the only reason I did that. So these little cakes right here is what you would have had if you had came out here, but now. So... <laughs> Oh, God is good. So, Father, we pray for everybody who's at home right now. May the Lord bless you. May tomorrow be a great and glorious day for you. May you find a way to just be thankful. We even also pray for those who have gone through great trauma this year. And the holidays are difficult for you. We don't ignore that and we're not going to forget that. Some 
We've lost family members this year. Some have had friends pass on. Some have gone through trauma. And so we pray for you now that the peace of God would surround you, that God would comfort your heart, that for some this is the first year that you haven't had that family member with you. And so we pray the peace of God and the comfort of God. May God cause you to hear their voice and may it bring you comfort. May you have good memories of them and with them who are no longer here. May the Lord remind you of good days you had together. And I pray that God would cause you to see, if they're in heaven, may the Lord cause you to see his presence in your house tomorrow. Not their presence, his presence in your house tomorrow as he comforts the family, as he brings peace among you all. May the Lord bless you, heal you, and strengthen you. And may the Lord release love and laughter to every house that's watching and every house in this place. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. amen. And if you're in town, I'm preaching here this coming Sunday. Um, this one, and I think the third Sunday in December. So that's the last two times I'll be ministering, except for Wednesdays. But this coming Sunday, if you're in town, meet us here at DC3. God has something for us. All right, be blessed. Amen.